Welcome to Design Talk 3, Playing Cards Case. This design talk is about a playing card storage case that I have designed. So let's look at this new design and discuss what my motivations were, what my approach was, and what my thoughts were as I went along. Eventually we will look closely at the live model and drawings in SolidWorks. As I mentioned in Design Talk Notchbox, I've been thinking about hinges and catches for 3D printed boxes. This playing cards case was designed with those things specifically in mind. Check out Notchbox Design Talk if you want an additional look at hinges and catches and a deeper look at 3D printer considerations. Also check out my TurboCAD tip number 33 if you want to see additional insights into 3D printing. One of the things I possess is a Zippo lighter. I've always admired its simple elegance and I've always admired how it became a timeless icon of sorts. Even without the engravings and the decals that are applied to the lighter to appease anyone's tastes, it retains that elegance. So the other day I was thinking about my Zippo and actually some playing cards. I thought that combining these two things might make for an interesting design and it would give me cause to try out some new hinging and catch designs. Once I began pondering the design, I knew I was in for another sleepless night. The first thing that came to mind was that I essentially wanted a hidden hinge and a hidden catch, so that would mean a different kind of hinge and catch than I had used before. I also knew I was going to be 3D printing the case, so I gave thought to how that would affect the design. As you'll see by the number of sketches on this and the next slide, the lights came on about five times during the night. So let's go ahead and talk about those sketches. In sketch one, I came up with the general shape which would include a thicker front and back wall to accommodate the hinge and the catch. The hinge itself was pretty much determined at this time. It would be hidden for the most part. I thought that the catch could slip into a slot and I began to ponder how that would look and how it might work. In two, I thought that a couple of linear indentations on the base and a couple of linear protrusions on the lid might be required to help keep alignment. Although these could still be included in the design, I decided against them in the 3D printed version. On the 3D printed version, they would need to be bigger than I would like to be of any use. In 3, I was pondering a different look for a slide catch. The lower portion would slide side to side in V-ways. It would be flush to the sides and to the front of the base when locked. This, in my opinion, would look definitely hidden. In 4, I started to rethink the catch and was pondering the best way to incorporate a spring to facilitate keeping the lid latched to the base when closed. In 5, I finalized the design in my mind. This meant adding a protrusion on the lid with a hole in it and tweaking the catch to include a protrusion that would act as the lock. Lastly, I decided that a small ribbon of spring steel would be formed to act as the spring, which it would definitely require. As is often the case, I decided that I'd be using SolidWorks for this project. I love the parametric and constraint features of the program. It's the ideal CAD software program to use when one is developing new products and many edits are expected to be made over the course of the development. So let's move into SolidWorks now and look at the playing cards case in all of its glory. So let's go ahead and have a closer look at this assembly. Here I can open it and I've got the mates adjusted so it stops at the location that it would be in this particular design. So next we'll just do an exploded view for this. Just like so. Now we can have a look at each part. So let's go ahead and select here, right mouse click and isolate this. And let's go ahead and look at the build. So we can go ahead and select this right mouse click and select edit part. Now we can come back here and expand this to see what our build looks like. So I should mention that this is the orientation it was printed in from bottom to top. So if we scroll up to this location, this is what I started with just with a double center point rectangle extruded up. 
And then I extruded a rectangle on the bottom to cap this. That's the same thickness as the sidewalls. Then I extruded a rectangle to create the hinge component here. And I did a full round fillet on the top. Next I did an extrude cut here with a circle to create the hinge pin hole. And then next I filleted the four outside corners and the bottom. Next I did an angled subtraction here. For some reason I couldn't mirror copy this feature over to this side so I ended up doing it over there the same way. Just do a cut extrusion. And then next I went ahead and created this cavity up here. Just extrude cut a rectangle. I think I went side to side from center plane. And then next I created a hinge pin hole here with an extrusion cut. Just like so. So pretty simple, straightforward. So I want to go ahead and select this to end that edit. And I'm going to exit isolate. Keep in mind that I made this for 3D printing, so I left some tolerances in there that would account for the gaps and whatnot I needed to make this work. If you didn't look at my Notchbox design talk, go back there and have a look for additional insights into tolerances. I'm going to select the lid here, right mouse click, and select isolate. And then I'm going to right mouse click over lid here and select edit part. That's going to allow us to scroll through here and look at the build. So if we have a look at that a bit closer. Here you can see I added chamfers on the inside sidewalls. That means that if the cards spread out a little bit at the top, like they might do when they get older, this will help slide them towards the center and fit within here without any issue. This could actually have been made even 60 degrees. This is at 45 now, but 60 would be fine or even a little bit more. So I'm just going to go to isometric view here. And I'm going to scroll this back or roll this back up to the beginning. So here I started with the same profile I had used for the base. And extruded. Next I extruded a rectangle on top to cap this. You're going to see that I added this as an afterthought. So in the beginning I created this with a flat top knowing that I was going to be printing in this orientation because I didn't want to have to use supports at the bottom here and I couldn't print it in a better way but eventually I didn't think it looked as good so I added the rounded portion just like so I ended up printing it the same way and using supports which I had to sand and it didn't look all that good when it was done so next I added this slot down here for the hinge and then I added this for the hinge pin. And then I added these fillets like this to match the bottom all around. And then I created this doing a subtraction extrude or a cut extrude I guess. And then next I added this protrusion and I cut a hole through there and then I chamfered here like so and I went ahead and chamfered here like so and we already discussed the reasoning behind that. So I'm going to select this to finish the edit and I'm going to select exit isolate. So let's move on to the catch. So I'm going to right mouse click and select isolate and we'll have a look at that. So I printed this in this orientation. And let's go ahead now and right mouse click here and select edit part and look at the build for that. So I started with this sketch like this extruded by the mid plane. Next I created a circle here and extruded it out. And then I did a cut here. And I went ahead and did a cut 
out the center here. This is the location where the spring will go. It comes up and then it tucks in behind this and it sits down on here to keep it from going anywhere. So let's select here and exit isolate. The hinge pin is very straightforward. It's just a circle extruded to the length. As for the spring catch, it's pretty straightforward as well. Let's just isolate that and have a look. Let's right mouse click here and select edit part. And let's expand this and roll this up. So I basically started as a 2D profile, this very shape. Then I extruded midpoint. Then I thought, well, I got sheet metal tools here, so let's go ahead and convert that into a sheet metal object, which I went ahead and did. That's going to allow me to create a flat pattern back in the drawings when required, just like so. So that's kind of neat. So I'm going to go ahead and end the edit and select Exit Isolate. Select Isometric View. So let's go ahead and move over to the drawings. So here we are with this drawing series. This is sheet one. This is the assembly. So on my assembly sheet, I typically use an ISO view, an exploded view, and a bill of materials. If we look down here at the title block, we can see some of the relevant information, including what dimensions are used, copyright here, the size and scale, and the title here. One thing you don't see on here is drawing numbers. That's typically something that's a good thing to use. If you want to learn a little bit more about drawing numbers that I used in my day work for many, many years, go ahead and look on my website and look for TurboCAD tip number 24. Let's move on to sheet two. This is my layout drawing. In the layout drawing, I usually have a bunch of views and I just put the envelope sizes of the main unit, just like this. Now we'll move on to sheet three, which is the first of the parts. In this case, it's the base. Here we have numerous views of the part, including some detail views and some cross sections. Of course, we have it annotated and dimensioned. Here we have a note about the hinge pin working in conjunction with this, where we want to ensure that there's a press fit for the hinge pin. Down here on the title block, we're starting to talk about materials and finishes. So if I was going to go ahead and produce this, I'm pretty sure that I'd use injection molding. And one of the things I was thinking about is how to get the different finishes that I'd like. So if we look back at the beginning image here, I'm showing a camouflage, something that looks like brushed aluminum. And these could be shiny plastic, I suppose. So I got to thinking about what we could do to do this out of plastic. So I did some internet searching. So one was talking about electroplating on plastic. So I read through this and saw that this is actually something that can be done. Um, although I specified polypropylene on my drawing, this one talks about how ABS is the one that is used the most in this process. Here you can see some of the different metals that can be plated onto plastic. So another one I looked at was about camouflage paint. So I looked at that and it's not like it's spraying out a camouflage. You can just get the different colors. And then what you do is you use stencils to help apply the different areas of the camouflage. So that sounds like quite the process, but I suppose it could be set up in a line to do that. Then of course, I just looked at basic paint for plastic. And you can get metallic ones and whatnot. So perhaps getting the different finishes like this might not be impossible. It would sure add to the cost of the process, but it might be worth it. And then, of course, you could do silk screening or labels themselves to add whatever you wanted to the sides. So let's move on to the next sheet. This is the next part. This is the lid. So again, we're just showing all the various views, section views, detail views all your dimensions and whatnot, and another note about the press fit with the hinge again. And then the next sheet is the catch. Again, different views with the different dimensions. Next is the hinge pin. Here we're asking for stainless steel 303, just a natural finish. 
And then again, a note about ensuring a press fit to the hinge holes on the lid and the catch holes on the base. Last sheet, of course, is the catch spring. So here I have the different views for the catch spring, including the flat pattern from the sheet metal. Here I'm requesting 1095 spring steel Rockwell C50 with a polished blue. For my prototype, I needed some kind of spring steel, and the only thing I could think of was some feeler gauges that I had in my drawer that I actually never used. So I had a look at those and found this 0.1 millimeter thick one that had just about the right thickness and just about the right amount of spring. So I cut off a chunk and trimmed it up as need be to make the spring fit in there, and it actually works really, really well. So that's the design in a nutshell and the thoughts and the motivations behind it. This is not something I'll be developing as a manufactured product, but it certainly could be. I hope that you enjoyed the presentation and that it will give you some things to think about while you're designing your own products. If you'd like to see some more TurboCAD tips for free, visit Don Check's TurboCAD Tips page. If you're interested in delving deeper into TurboCAD learning, be sure to check out the full project tutorials on my Textual Creations shopping page. See you next time.